Good morning and welcome to our online services at Vintage Church. I'm Pastor Timothy, this is my wife Tara, and we're so thrilled that you decided to join us this morning on mm-hmm. Facebook or YouTube at Vintage Church. We want to make Jesus irresistible in our everyday life. We want to see fruitful and flourishing lives and families that make Jesus irresistible in the city of Lodi and beyond. And so if you want to know more or you want to connect with us, uh, I'd encourage you to visit us on our website at Mm vintage1948.com. And there you'll also find one of our connect forms where you can fill that out. And we'd love to follow up with you, hear your story, share a little bit about our heart and mission behind the church. We'd love for you to join us and be on mission here in Lodi Mm -hmm. to make Jesus irresistible. And so one of the ways that we do that is by equipping people Mm -hmm. um, to be better followers of Jesus. And we do that through Bible study. And so the ladies have been in a great Bible study in 1 Peter. How's that going? Wow, guys, it's been amazing. Um, I know for the ladies that have been able to hang on and keep going week by week, um, we have just been blessed by the ministry under Jen Wilkins. That's the teacher that we have been following under and the discussion. It is just so incredible when women get to gather together and just learn about the word of God and talk through it. There's just so much growth. Yeah. It's great. So with that, we have about two more weeks left. We're almost wow, over. Yeah, it went fast. So we're starting week eight this Tuesday at 10 a.m. You can always join us in person in the fellowship room or you can always join us online through Zoom. Um, just go ahead and text me and I will always send you that Zoom link. Um, and then after we're about done on February 23rd, ladies, this is for everyone that calls Venice Church their home. We would like to host a luncheon um, and details, more details about how that's going to look and what's that going to look like is to come. Okay. Um, so it's going to be at 10 a.m. in the fellowship um, room. Um, so I just want to throw that out to, to all of the ladies, whether you've participated one day or no days. Um, I want to see you on February 23rd in the fellowship room at 10 a.m. Um, and then we're going to take a break. We're going to, for the month of March, take a break. We're following the calendar um, with the school district. My lovely children are off for two weeks. Yeah. Um, and then we will resume our next Bible study after Easter. So stay tuned for all of that information yeah. to come your way. I will make sure to get that out to each of you guys through the month of March, what we're going to be studying and all of those details. So stay tuned for that. So I hope yeah. to see you this Tuesday. And that frees us up to kind of think about and plan for what Easter may look like. Right. I, I don't know all the answers. <laughs> um, hopefully we can have an in-person gathering. Yeah. Um, and so let's pray for that. Yes. But um, I am excited. This is our second um, Easter, Easter here, here at the church. Yeah, and, it is. Um, it's been different. It was very Easter different. is the Super Bowl, which is today as well. Go Tom Brady. Uh, but oh, you're Easter, Tom Brady. We just, I just, I'm sorry. I'm voting for the other team. You're voting for the Patrick Mahomes? Well, here's the deal. Um, <laughs> last year on our fantasy football team, um, I had Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady on uh-huh. my team. So I like both of the quarterbacks. I just so want Tom Brady to win. You wait. do that and I'll do Patrick Mahomes. Okay. Great. That's good. Well, Some competition. We'll see. <laughs> but for many churches, Easter is like the Super Bowl. And yeah. so it's just been weird with COVID-19. So mm-hmm. be praying for us. Yeah. Be praying for our plans and how we might reach our city. Because right. that's what we want to do is reach our community and mm-hmm. love Lodi. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, next Sunday, it's... Valentine's Day. Yep. And so um, for all those special <laughs> ones in your life, yeah. I have four daughters that I have to plan dates for. Yes. Um, but, you know, love Lodi and February is often a love month, mm-hmm. the month of love. And mm-hmm. so and Tara actually had the idea of what if we took February mm-hmm. every year and said, this is Love Lodi month. Yeah. And we love some local businesses. We love some local schools um, and just love Lodi during February. And I thought it was a great idea. And so we've been tossing around some ideas about maybe some 
what some some so, schools yeah doing a couple of schools um especially the staff there is from what i'm learning is at all the schools there may not be all the teachers but all the office people are there every day right. and they work really hard and they're the ones that are really on the front lines dealing with the parents and we can be difficult at times so <laughs> i felt that i think it'd be a great way to just love all the office people that are there serving really the community yeah. um, at large while we're going through distance learning so yeah and nice. and if you have any ideas on how we mm -hmm. can love lodi We'd love to hear from you. Yes, um, comment please. below yeah. or send us an email. My yeah. email is pt at vintage1948.com. Right and so we'd love to hear from you. Yes. And um, not only on Valentine's Day, but all throughout the month of yes. February, we yeah. want to just love Lodi. And so that yeah. means we're going to pray for Lodi. Yeah. We're going to serve Lodi and we're going to be generous towards Lodi. Yes. And so we would love for you to partner with us in yeah. that. Um, not only through your prayers or your service, but even your generosity. Mm -hmm. And so at Vintage Church, there's always three ways that you can give. Mm -hmm. um, you can give um, online, mm -hmm. vintage1948.com backslash give. Mm -hmm. And there you'll find a number where you can also text in your gift. It's really easy. My preferred method. And then you can always make out your checks. Here's the big news. Um, you can make it to Vintage Church now. All the paperwork is done. Yay. And there's been a lot of transition and change, but yeah. we're there. And so um, you can make your checks out to Vintage Church. Yeah. And if you forget and you say Lodi Community Church, that's, that's still acceptable. <laughs> but now we're going to be saying make your checks out to Vintage Church. Vintage Church and you can mail that or drop it off during the week at the office as long as I'm here. And so... Thank you again for yes. all of your generosity yes. and supporting us. And if you do want to make that gift for um, Love Lodi, which has now become like our um, overarching outreach line item right. on our budget. So right. any money that comes in towards Love Lodi will be used to reach mm -hmm. our community, to love and serve Lodi, to yeah. be generous towards them. And by doing that, as we learned last week, we store up our treasures, not here on earth, yeah. but in heaven. Amen. And so um, I'm excited for that. And I'd love for you to partner with us in this gospel work. And so with that, now is our call to worship. Mm. And so today um, we're in Matthew's gospel. We're looking at anxiety. And I know for many mm. of us this year, um, anxiety has just gone through the roof yes. and, um, yes. and I just want us to remember Jesus's words. Well, really it's the author of Proverbs who said, trust in the Lord mm -hmm. with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. And it sure does feel sometimes this year that our path has not been straight. Right. Um, it's right. been crooked and, uh, circuitous and all over the place yeah. and but it says trust in the Lord and this morning as we prepare to sing and to lift up the Lord would you just be reminded this morning that he's trustworthy that he knows the details of your life better than any other person on this planet and that he cares for you Amen. who are we that he is mindful of us but it says in his word he is mindful and he cares for us and so we can trust him and so would you just join me in prayer this morning i know um this week and the week before we've lost some of our members in their battle to, with cancer and there's another dearly loved saint uh gary that is knocking on heaven's door and so i had this great opportunity to sing hymns with him and he sat up and began to sing hymns mm. like when the roll is called up yonder mm. and victory in Jesus and mm. leaning on the everlasting arms and some others. And it was a highlight of mine um, just to see someone that comes alive with singing. And that's why we sing. I know right. it's I know it's not the same it's, as being in yeah. person. I mean being able to sing hymns with just a small group in that living room was a whole different experience right. than trying to sing with my family in our PJs in our living room. But
But but would you sing? Even just if it's you, would you just sing along? Mm. Would you sing and make a joyful noise to the Lord? Um, because it does make our souls alive. Amen. And so would you pray with me, Jesus, as we prepare to worship and sing this mm -hmm. morning? Would you meet us wherever we're at? Would the words on the screen just be prayers of our hearts mm -hmm. and melodies in our souls that exalt you, Jesus? We love you and we ask that you would meet us and be with all of us as we continue to face the uncertainty of our day, knowing that you are faithful and that you are sovereign and you're in control. Root our hearts in Jesus and may he be the rock of our refuge. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. The words will be on the screen, but let's worship and sing to the Lord this morning.
try to feel leaning on the everlasting arms I have blessed peace with my Lord so near leaning on the everlasting Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. We're going to be reading verses 25 to 34 this morning. And we're continuing in our series in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to continue that up until Palm Sunday. And so we'll be able to finish our series in the Sermon on the Mount the Sunday before Palm Sunday, and then we will have our Palm Sunday service and Easter service, and I'm eager to plan more about that. But until then, we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount, and it gets good. And so I am excited for the next few weeks as we dive into the last part or the second half of the Sermon on the Mount. But if you would, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? We're going to be in, again, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34. And remember, we stand to honor God's word, to um, posture ourselves in an attitude of receiving so that we might hear and believe the word of the Lord. And so in verse 25, it says this, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds in the air they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not of more value than they and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life 
And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." Let's pray this morning. Father, we need this teaching from you. In our day, in our world, in our country, there are many who struggle and wrestle with anxiety, depression. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak this morning um, to your people, to this world, that you would instruct us on how not to be anxious and give us hope and invite us to come to you again this morning. All of us who are weary and heavy burdened and laden down, and we ask, Lord, that you would give us rest, rest for our souls. Speak. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anxiety. What is anxiety? Uh, One definition that I saw was anxiety is the body's response to worry and fear. Another I saw that I particularly liked was um, anxiety is generalized fear. It's not even something specific. There's no specificity to the fear. It's general. It's my child says, what are you afraid of? And they just say, I don't know. It's a overwhelming uh, stimulus. It's an overwhelming response to some generalized fear. And um, have you ever thought what is the most uh, frequent or repeated command in the Bible? Well, it's this, do not be afraid or fear not. And why is it that of all the commands in Scripture where God tells us uh, an imperative, a command, is it fear not? Because in this sin-stained world that we live in, this broken world, fear is a reality. And I like what Donald Millard say. He says, the most often repeated commandment in the Bible is do not fear. It's in there over 200 times. And that means a couple of things. If you think about it, it means we are going to be afraid. And it means we shouldn't let fear boss us around. Before I realized we were supposed to fight fear, I thought of fear as a subtle suggestion in our subconscious designed to keep us safe or, more important, keep us from getting humiliated. And I guess it serves that purpose. But fear isn't only a guide to keep us safe. It's also a manipulative emotion that can trick us into living a boring life. Do not fear the most repeated command in the scriptures. And after looking at the statistics on anxiety and depression, um, I understand why. Because anxiety is literally crippling America. Um, Anxiety is the most common mental disorder in the U.S. Some 40 million adults, that doesn't even include um, children under the age of 18, suffer from anxiety. Now, I know there's uh, many different types of anxiety, but the Anxiety and Depression and Association of America in 2020 said that 40 million adults suffer from anxiety. Now, anxiety can be caused according to social scientists from many different causes. Increased stress, traumatic events, 2020, anyone, um, low self-esteem, even genetics, personality, or environmental stressors, etc. Um, this issue of anxiety and stress and depression, it's a complex issue. It's not black and white, and yet um, how Americans today are 
dealing with anxiety is not um, that complex. Americans are managing it primarily through the use of antidepressants. Um, between 1988 and 1994 and 2005, 2008, the use of antidepressants increased by almost, get this, 400%. And since then, since 2008, it's only increased according to one 2017-2018 study. And that doesn't even account for COVID-19 and 2020. It's only gone up. In fact, in 2020, there was a shortage of antidepressants. Prescription, prescriptions shot up 21% between February and March in 2020 alone. And before 2020, 11% of Americans were taking an antidepressant. And it's higher than ever today. This is a crisis, and many would agree that this is a existential crisis today. Um, anxiety is everywhere. And so as we are in the Sermon on the Mount, the, the question this morning is, well, what would Jesus say? What would Jesus say to an anxious and scared world? And I believe Jesus would say, looking at our text this morning, he would say this, O oh, you of little faith, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, by me just saying that word repent, you probably have the image of someone on a street corner with a giant sign that says repent um, of your sin or just repent, repent and burn, right? But here's the thing. Remember that before the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus began his public ministry, what was the message of Jesus. It was really clear, and in Matthew's gospel, chapter 4, he said this, he began to preach and announce this message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, Jesus's primary message was, think differently, the king of heaven is is here. The Messiah is here. The kingdom of God is beginning to blossom on the earth. Things are changing, and make sure you are on the right side of redemptive history. Think about it. Even in this passage that we're looking at, Jesus points out that the Gentiles, that these would be the, the, the nuns we talked about last week or the secularists of our day. They were running around frantic and fearful in Rome and all over the Mediterranean. You see, anxiety, it's not a new mental health disorder. We've just categorized it, analyzed it, studied it in a lab, and prescribed a lot of antidepressants for it. Now, please note, this is a complex anxiety. This is a complex and a sensitive subject. And as I said, there are many living with anxiety and depression. And I'm not saying this morning that taking antidepressants is somehow inherently wrong or sinful. Not at all. Human beings are complex creatures, but we are creatures made by a creator. And that's an important distinction. We are both body and spirit. We are a living soul. According to Genesis 2, verse 7, human was formed from the dust of the ground and the breath of life, the very breath of God. And thus, we are beautiful creatures. We are souls made in the image of God. And we are certainly like the psalmist in Psalm 139, fearfully and wonderfully made. So this isn't as simple as believe more or have more faith or if you do suffer from anxiety and depression that you are somehow some kind of junior varsity Christian. But what I believe Jesus wants us to see this morning is that our faith, like a muscle, grows and develops. Yes, Faith is powerful, even in mustard seed form, but faith can be increased. And that's really good news this morning. I remember the disciples saying, 
Lord, increase our faith when he taught them about forgiveness. So faith can be increased. And so when Jesus says to his followers, O oh, you of little faith, get this, this is not some type of insult. This is not some type of jab. It's a diagnosis. Remember, Jesus' half-brother, Jude, said this, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt. And that includes yourself. A lack of faith is not an insult. It's a diagnosis. And if you are struggling in the faith department this morning, have mercy on yourself. And it, it's kind of like someone at the gym, you know, saying you have more work to do. It's not personal. It's not a jab or an insult. It's just a reality. Um, this week... I recently started working out again. It had been some five months and I had, since I had been in the gym. And um, man, one week in, I am really sore. My legs, they're killing me. And um, as we were, I think it was on Thursday, we were doing upper body. And um, I remember the trainer was like, okay, next one is tricep dips. And it was where you took some dumbbells and you put your arms back and you try to do a tricep dip to strengthen your triceps. And um, I remember I couldn't even lift my body. I was done. I was exhausted. My muscles were exhausted. There was no way that I was going to be able to lift up my body and do a proper tricep dip. And so I just sat there um, for that minute of the training session. And, you know, when that happened, it wasn't an insult. When he said, come on, it's all right, get better or do better or it, it, you can't do that. You'll get there one day. That's not an insult. It's just a reality. It's a diagnosis. I don't take it personal. It just revealed where I was at. It revealed that my strength, it's not what it used to be. And so that I need to build up my strength in my arms. And so it, this morning, if you identify with the many who suffer from crippling anxiety, this is not an insult or even a suggested quick fix. It's an invitation from a loving father, a merciful king who wants to show you how to build your faith up, who wants to grant you repentance, a changing of the mind to think differently about the world, your everyday life, and renew your mind. Renew your mind so that you no longer have to conform to the pattern of this world. One of internalized chicken littles, if you would, screaming, the sky is falling. That accurately depicts Jesus' picture here in Matthew chapter 6 of the Gentiles looking frantically for things that just don't last. And Jesus wants us to be transformed ultimately into something truly irresistible in this world, an image bearer of God himself, redeemed and restored by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is inviting us to listen to his diagnosis of our faith, of our heart, and invite us to trust in him, to experience revelation, to repent or change our mind and think differently, to renew our mind that we may reflect him in our everyday life. This is what I like to call the 4R revolution. Revelation, repentance, renewal, reflecting. And so let's unpack Jesus' diagnosis this morning. We see in verse 25 that Jesus starts off this passage with the word therefore. And I was always taught whenever you see the word therefore, you have to find out what it's there for. And so we cannot continue until we see this morning that verses 19 to 24 or last week's sermon um, and this passage on anxiety, they're connected. In the previous verses, remember, Jesus contrasted two treasures two visions and two masters. The implied truth 
therefore, here is that the one who is a slave to money, think verse 24, and has a stingy eye, think verse 23, and stores up his treasure on earth, verse 19, is destined, hear this, destined to be anxious. It is unescapable. Remember, anxiety is the body's response to worry and fear. And if you don't deal with the root, worry and fear, then you will be anxious. Anxiety is a given. And in this world, fear is a given. And so therefore, we must learn how to fight fear. We must learn that fear is not to be the boss of us, as Don Miller said. Think about it. In Jesus' words, moth and rust can destroy our treasure or thieves can break in and steal everything that we've worked for. And if this is the case and if our treasures are stored up here on earth, then it's easy to live with anxiety. It's easy to look around and always be suspicious or anxious or fear that your hard-earned treasure would be stolen or destroyed. And so... If we live with this type of anxiety that lives underneath the surface of our everyday life, then we often will try to numb our anxiety through mindless entertainment or binging Netflix shows or even overeating or drinking too much wine or the overuse of medication or even other unhealthy coping mechanisms because all of us will cope with anxiety and stress differently. And Jesus is teaching us how to fight fear and worry. And there are even destructive, far more destructive coping mechanisms that many, especially teens these days, are using because of this under-the-surface generalized fear or anxiety. And Jesus is offering us hope this morning. You see, stress and anxiety, they don't just magically disappear. They, they have to manifest somewhere in our everyday life. So for example, if you are stressed and anxious, that might appear in your being short with your family. Maybe your temper is not under control, or maybe you're having outbursts of anger, or you're complaining a lot, or you're eating too much. And all of us have been there. Stress is a reality that we must all deal with. But stress will always find a way to be relieved. Always. And so the good news this morning is that Jesus invites the weary. He invites the burden to come to himself so that at the cross that we can exchange our worry, our fear, our stress and our anxiety for his peace that surpasses understanding. And that's good news this morning. And so we have to see that Jesus is inviting us to repent or to think differently. That's literally what the word repent or metanoia means, to change one's mind, to change their behavior, to think differently, to see the world differently, to change our mind, to change the narrative, to change the story, to change our master or who we worship. And if we would change our vision, then we would change our treasure. This is the path towards transformation that Jesus offers us in this text. There's no other way. The kingdom of heaven is at hand with every one of Jesus' words here in Matthew's gospel. And we have the opportunity to receive the kingdom, believe the king, and change everything. Or... Simply ignore it. And if we try to adopt only a part of it, that is the same as ignoring it. Nothing will change. Jesus' command, do not be anxious about your life, can only be obeyed if the king of our heart is Jesus. And our vision or our narrative, it's formed around the gospel of the kingdom and our treasure what we live for, is stored in heaven in Christ Jesus. This is how we construct a battlement for warring with anxiety that constantly sieges our soul in this broken era and age. Now, in this passage, Jesus talks about what we eat and what we drink, our physical health and our clothes. And 
all of these are representatives of our everyday life. Note Jesus' words here. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Meaning that there is something more to our everyday life than just eating, drinking, putting on clothes, going to work, or watching TV. These things that normally make up our everyday existence, there is something more. Hear that. There is something more to your everyday life. Something deeper, something more majestic, more glorious. But we have to have eyes to see it. It must be revealed to us by our Father in heaven. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here in this text. He's wanting to remind his disciples, his followers, that there is something more to everyday life. And so he gives two how much more arguments um, from the birds and the lilies here in this passage. Now, a note of caution. Birds do not just sit in trees and wait for their creator to feed them. They have to work. They have to gather. They have to build. And God has made a world where there is enough raw materials to meet our needs. Now, for sure, sin has corrupted God's good world. There are famines. There is disease. There is scarcity. But often not because of a lack of a raw materials, but it's because of greed. Because there are many who still are slaves to mammon or money, who see the world with a stingy eye and store up for themselves treasures here on the earth. These are the fearful and the anxious among us. These are the smogs of the world. In the words of J.R.R. Token, these are the greedy, strong, and wicked worms who do anything to protect their precious treasure, no matter what relationship or life they burn down in the process. What Jesus wants his disciples to see and believe, what he wants you to see and believe this morning, is that they and you are more valuable than these lesser creatures and creations. He wants them to understand. He wants you to understand your dignity and your worth. You are created in the image of God, and no other earthly creature shares this honor. You are beloved and unique. And I want you just to breathe that truth in this morning. I have inherent value, worth, and dignity. I am of more value than they. Indeed, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, Jesus then brings in this passage some common sense, you could say, that many of us, we, we just can't see due to the own, our own blindness because of fear and anxiety. And that is this, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Here's the real question. Does anxiety change anything? Does it change or help anything? No, it doesn't. Does fretting change anything? It reminds me of an old English proverb. Fear knocked out the door. Faith answered and no one was there. It also reminds me of the times my baseball coach or I fought with the referee or the umpire. And the only thing that ever changed was the strike zone. And it really bummed me out as the pitcher. You see, fear paralyzes. Anxiety cripples. And this is its wicked aim. Remember, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. His primary weapon in this world is fear and lies. Remember Adam and Eve. They were naked and they were unashamed before they sinned. But once sin began to corrupt God's good creation through their own disobedience, think about it, they instantly experienced what? Fear, guilt, and shame. And then they hid underneath fig leaves. Can you imagine that? Trying to hide from the creator of the universe behind fig leaves? But we do the same thing today. We try to mask and hide our fear our guilt and our shame behind modern day fig leaves. So maybe just pause and think, what fig leaves are you hiding behind this morning? 
what fig leaves, what source of comfort or source of pleasure or entertainment or even work and ambition are you hiding, that you're using as a fig leaf to hide your fear, your anxiety, your worry, your guilt, or your shame? And in contrast to fear, faith begets confidence. Faith gives us boldness. If, here's a big if, if one's faith is in something secure and steadfast or enduring. And here, Jesus is saying this morning, put your faith not in the things of this world. Put your faith in the heavenly Father. Why? Because he is enduring. He is infinite. He is immutable. He is a rock of refuge. And he loves you. He loves you with a loyal love that never gives up and never runs out. And so Jesus continues with this second how much more argument. And he says, look at the lilies. Look at the flowers of the field. He says, look at how beautiful they are. Now, next week is Valentine's Day and flowers are a big deal. Um, I got to remind myself to buy my wife some flowers. But remember... On Valentine's Day, think about this, 250 million roses are produced for Valentine's Day. Just on flowers alone, $2 billion is spent every February 14th. And a week or so after Valentine's Day, where are all those flowers thrown in the garbage? And yet $2 billion is spent on the beauty of roses and other flowers. He then compares flowers to Solomon. He says, listen, Solomon, who was perhaps the most wise and most wealthy man in all of scriptures, he says he can't even begin to compare with the flowers of the field. And maybe that's because Solomon's wealth and his treasure was ultimately tainted by sin. He was capable of being corrupted by sin, as we all are. But here, here's Jesus' point this morning in this passage. You are infinitely more valuable than the flowers of the field. You are infinitely more valuable than the birds of the air. And if he cares for them... If he has a purpose for them, if each of them is a masterpiece in their own right, how much more are you, image bearer of God, more valuable to God, who was given a purpose to display the glory of God in their everyday life? You are valuable. You are much more valuable than you would even imagine to the God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth. And so here again is the diagnosis this morning. And, and it may hurt, but it is from the great physician himself. O oh, you of little faith. O oh, you of little faith. And he says it right there in verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Think of all those red roses that are going to be thrown away after Valentine's Day. Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Now, please hear me this morning. Jesus is not insulting you. He is trying to strengthen you. He is inviting you to something more. Remember, this life is more than just eating and drinking. And this is why Paul could tell the Corinthians that because of the gospel, because of Jesus, whatever we eat, whatever we drink, whatever we do in our everyday life, we can do it all for the glory of God. And so what is Jesus' prescription after the diagnosis? He says, don't run after these things. Don't pursue these things. Don't treasure these things. Don't hold them as ultimate in your everyday life. Hold them loosely. Do not be overran with fear, thinking about what shall I eat and what shall I drink and what shall I wear again. And I, I cannot help but think, of, after repeating these questions, how many arguments between a husband and a wife have happened over what shall I eat or what shall I drink or what shall I wear and God saying, hey, those aren't ultimate. 
But does, now, does this mean that we are just to throw out all of our concern um, about what we eat, drink, or wear? No, not at all. I mean, please put on clothes, please, and eat healthy. But we must understand that our life, our everyday life, it's just much more than eating, drinking, and putting on clothes. This ordinary life that we've been given by God is meant to be extraordinary. It's meant to display the glory of God, to make Jesus irresistible, to bear fruit to the glory of God. Now, Jesus says here that the Gentiles or those non-covenant individuals, those who don't worship God of the Bible, that they are seeking, looking after Seeking after these earthly things. This is all they think about. Why? Because it consumes their mind. It consumes their time. Because it overflows from a heart that loves the things of this world. It is their identity. It is their significance. It is the image that they want to convey in the world. And all of those things come from these earthly items, things. Why? Because they are slaves. In Jesus' words, they are slaves to money. And their vision or their story, it's caught up in the pattern of this world. And their treasure, therefore, is being stored up on the earth. And I think C.S. Lewis accurately describes such a person. He says, We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy, the much more, the infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday or vacation at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We are far too easily pe- pleased. We concern ourselves with what we eat and what we drink and what we wear. And Jesus is saying, listen, don't be anxious about that. I know that you need all that, but life is something more. And so Jesus tells his followers, he tells you, your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. He says it right here in verse 32, for the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. It's the same God who clothed Adam and Eve after they sinned against him who gently removed those fig leaves that they were hiding behind, and he covered them with warm clothes of a skin of a sacrificed animal that foreshadowed Jesus in such a beautiful way. This is the same God who knows your every need, who does not want us to fend for ourselves, to look for our identity in what we do, eat, or drink. He wants our identity to become a part of his gift to us in Jesus and the gospel. He knows that we are scared. He knows that as we journey through this sin-stained and broken world, He knows. He knows that fear is a reality. He knows that worry is a reality. And He knows. And He says, don't be anxious. Why? Because I am your heavenly Father, and I know that you need all these things. And not only do I know, but I have provided the answer and the ultimate solution in Jesus Christ and His gospel. And so he invites us to repent, to think differently because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, the king, is on the scene and he will go to the cross and he will die for our sins and he will absorb our wrath, God's wrath and our worry. And then he will raise from the dead to offer us new life and the hope of transformation in this present age as we wait for the coming of our great God and king who will make all things new in the new heavens and the new earth. You see, we must remind ourselves this morning to put our faith in a merciful Father and a loving King who laid down His life for us to make it undoubtedly clear that we are valuable and that life is much more than just eating and drinking and that because of Jesus and the gospel that our purpose 
that was given to all men and to all women, to all human beings in the Garden of Eden can be redeemed, that it can be restored, and that we can experience the garden life, a fruitful and a flourishing life that makes Jesus irresistible, an ever-increasing experience through the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit until those new heavens and new earth dawn on this broken earth and all things are remade and made new. And we dwell in the garden city with God forever and ever. And next week, we're going to unpack that idea a little bit more as we drill down deep into the verse 33. One of my favorites that says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And so we're going to unpack that idea more next week. But for today... I want to just leave, I want us to focus on Jesus' last final practical instruction this morning. And hopefully it serves us well in these crazy days of COVID-19. I know for many of us, we have suffered um, so much uncertainty and so much instability over the last year and even at the beginning of this year. There's so much that looms on the horizon. And with that, Jesus says, Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Think about it. In this sin-stained world, there will always be trouble. Every single day will bring some challenge or some pit that we may fall in. But there's no... Excuse me, there's no need to worry about tomorrow. Why? Because Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you today. And tomorrow, which will be then today when you're experiencing it, my mercies, they're new every morning. So the grace that I have for you is for today. And that same grace that I had for you today, I'll have that grace for you tomorrow. So don't worry about tomorrow. Just be engaged and be present today. Rejoice in your God today. Rest in the finished work of Jesus today. Trust him today and live out your everyday life to the glory of God by trusting in him, your heavenly Father. God has promised enough grace and mercy for today. And when tomorrow comes, friends, Whatever trouble may come with it, he has promised us that his mercies, they're new every morning. And so today and tomorrow, we will pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. His grace is sufficient for you today. His mercy is new this morning. And his grace will be sufficient for you tomorrow, whatever may come. And his mercy will be new tomorrow, whatever the day may bring. So let us trust in the Lord and not be anxious and learn to trust our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we need to hear your instruction this morning. So many of us deal with anxiety and depression. So many of us run around like the Gentiles of this world. Help us no longer conform to the pattern of this world. Help us to renew our mind. Help us to repent, knowing that your kingdom is at hand in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help us to understand that because of the gospel, whatever we do, whether we eat or whether whether we drink, we can do it all for the glory of God. And that in our everyday life, we can make Jesus irresistible. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope that that message was encouraging to you. Mm -hmm. And um, I just know that so many of us are dealing with anxiety mm -hmm. and even depression. And if anxiety is how we respond to worry or fear, man, there's just a lot these days to be worried about or to be afraid of. 
And I just want to remind you that the most repeated command in all of scripture is what? Yeah. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Jesus knows that we're going to encounter fear. Yes. That anxiety and worry is going to be a reality in our life. And so <laughs> the part of this service is, you know, it's just how do we wrestle with these truths and apply them right. in everyday life? And one of the questions we talked about was, you know, what is our fig leaf or how do we cope with our anxiety, um, our fear right. and our worry? We all have our different coping yes, mechanisms. We do. And remember, <laughs> anxiety can be onset through trauma, mm -hmm. through stress, through low self esteem. And yes, yeah, some of it's even genetic and personality driven. There's a whole lot of factors. Remember, it's complex. But, you know, for me, and Tara will share a little bit here, you know, we were trying to work out, I mentioned that in the sermon. And mm. things were going well, <laughs> but then we had a trauma in yeah. our life. And, yeah. you know, we lost Caesar um, to a tragedy. And yeah. he was, you know, someone that had come to our home as a junior in high school. And we had kind of brought him in and made him a part of our family, mm -hmm. became legal guardians. And we considered him, you know, like a son. And our kids think of him as a brother. And to lose him to a tragedy was traumatic. Right. for all of us and even my son today on distance learning will start crying out of nowhere because he is dealing with the worry and the fear of the unknown and all these different things trauma is real and it can bring anxiety in our lives and i know for me i just kind of let go mm -hmm. um, and i probably gained about 20 pounds of just um, too many starbucks salted caramel cold <laughs> brews and um, different, you know, uh, eating out. And it was just, that was my one of my biggest fig right. leaves of ways to deal with worry and fear for me is, is that. And it's a bad fig leaf. It doesn't really cover it um, because it starts poking out in other places. <laughs> um, and so for me, I've, that's just been one for me. What about you? Have you had any fig leaves. Oh. I know distance learning and this year has been a lot. Yeah, the, so. the snowball effect of after Caesar and continuing distance learning with no end in sight. And then I I lost my childhood best friend. Um, and that was another trauma that occurred. Um, and then distance learning continues. And um, so for me, the fig leaf would definitely be, you know, I get whether the feeling of paralyzed where I just don't want to get out of bed. Um, and if I do, I don't put any effort in my physical appearance. I would just stay in my jammies and just feel that sluggish, no motivation to do anything, um, to just stay on the couch and cope. Um, and the other way is definitely eating. So that's not good for either one of us because we feed that in our fig leaf, you know, and it's always a night craving eating. It's the late night where you just go and get the foster freeze run, <laughs> ice cream, chips. Um, it was a way I coped with a lot of pain and a lot of loss and, and not just my own personal pain and loss, but my kids pain and loss. Um, it was the way that I was, I, I do, I cope that way. And so, you know, one of the things that we mentioned in the sermon is that, you know, when we were created, we were made from the dust and then the breath of life and we became a living soul. And so there's two parts of us. There's the physical and then there's the spiritual. And so, you know, oftentimes we can talk about just the physical or just the spiritual but reality is we need to learn that they both affect and influence one another. Yes. And so what we were talking about is, you know, some of the things that we've been learning, healthy ways to deal with anxiety, yes. fear, and worry. Yeah. Yes, read your Bible. Yes, believe pray. the promise of God. Yeah. Yes, pray. <laughs> yeah. But that's not enough. Yeah. And um, when I say it's not enough is we're a com complex human being right. and so sometimes it, you don't pray because your body's so tired and demotivated that it's harder for you to pray remember jesus said the spirit is willing but the flesh, flesh is yeah. weak so your spirit may be well willing but your flesh is weak yeah. so take a walk yeah. 
go get some exercise, right. go get some sun and let that bring your body alive physiologically. Right. Go get some exercise, work out, go for a walk, talk to someone, have someone give you a hug, a, yes. a loved one. Have yeah, some, I know thing. it's hard in COVID-19 times, but if you have someone in your household, Hug them a lot. I, yeah. I run around to my daughters and say, affection, <laughs> affection, because it releases, it releases like serotonin. Yeah, yeah, serotonin and it's and so it's release. natural. And yeah. so remember, we, the spirit may be willing, but yeah. the flesh can be weak. Feed. You have to feed both mm -hmm. body and spirit. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one thing that we've done yeah. that has helped our family, I would say, get back on track, especially in the last few weeks, is implementing this thing called Sabbath in yeah. our weekly rhythm. Yeah. Uh, I love how Caleb, he like is like, <laughs> five o'clock, yeah. it's Sabbath. And he likes to tell everyone about it. <laughs> for us, our family, Sabbath is from 5 p.m. on Friday to yeah. 5 p.m. on Saturday. Yes. And it's basically, it starts with a prayer mm -hmm. and we just say, God, um, we're resting from yeah. our work. Yeah. We're not producing or creating anything. Yeah. We're just going to enjoy you and we're going to enjoy the gifts that you have given us. Good food, um, good music, good stories, fun, bike rides to yeah. Lodi Lake, exercising, nails for mom, or whatever brings us joy, joy. and causes us to rest yeah. in him and to remember the good gifts that he's given us. Mm -hmm. And just that has helped me at least yeah. reorient and to really understand that I don't need to be anxious. Right. He's still God and I can stop working. I can stop checking my emails. I can stop checking Twitter because he's God and he's right. in control. And I don't need to, I'm not God. Um, I'm, I'm not a robot. I'm, I'm a living human being. Mm -hmm. And I need to learn how to, to be yep. and to rest yep. and to be present because that's what you need more yep. than anything. Yep. You need the presence of me as your husband. My kids need the presence of me and being engaged in my kid's mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And when we're just busy trying to mask our um, fear and yep. worry and anxiety with fig leaves, it doesn't work. No. And so what about you? What have been some good mechanisms that you've implemented yeah. to help you um, drop those fig leaves and embrace God. So a, a huge one, um, you know, I love how he, you put it. It is both spirit and flesh because I was realizing I was growing spiritually. You know, the Bible study was huge for me personally. It was anchoring me in the word of God, getting me into it daily. Um, and I also, I tell the ladies this every Tuesday, it was my favorite day because I loved the fellowship time. I looked forward to seeing their faces um, and talking through the Word of God. Um, and that was happening, but there was a physical part that I was still feeling the sluggish. I was still feeling um, just no energy. And I had to take a, you know, a pulse of what's going on with my body. And because it's both. And I had to do this not just with me, but with my kids as well. And so practically it was, we got a gym, you know, we started working out. I went to him, I said, we need to physically work out. And that works great for me in the morning because it boosts my energy. Um, or eating, what you put in your body oh, is what your body's gonna give you. So if you're constantly feeding it junk, don't be surprised if you feel like sluggish and not wanting to get up. And that will impact your Bible reading, your it prayer, and all these other spiritual and then, yeah, things. Yeah, and the anxiety and worry will just come out in different ways. You know, for me, it will be where I'm just barking at the kids for chores and wanting, because I want to control something. So when anxiety is so high in my life, what I can control, I'm trying to grab on and control it. Right. So cleaning for me is... It's great that I like a clean and orderly house, but it's not great when mom is right. freaking out in freak out mode yeah. because there's anxiety back here and it's pushing Giving me. all of us anxiety. I'm giving them all anxiety. <laughs> um, that's why, you know, he didn't mention this, but part of Sabbath, we don't, we don't do chores. We don't expect our kids to do chores. We have 24 hours of choreless. Um, so we work hard six days Heaven and, we, on earth. <laughs> and we rest <laughs> those 24 hours, no chores. Um, so, so exercising, I've been eating um, way more cleaner, feeding my body. I've also implemented that with my children. Um, getting outside, encouraging them. When the sun is out, get that natural vitamin D. Um, your body needs it. You right. need to soak it in. Um, taking vitamins. I purposely have went to, you know, 
to buy certain vitamins for each of my kids and for us um, to make sure that we're feeding our body that way too. So marrying the two, and I can tell you that my circumstances hasn't changed at all. You know, the grieving process of Caesar and my friend um, is still there and I still walk through that. Um, distance learning, still happening. Um, and I don't see any end right now. And we still currently. have COVID-19. <laughs> we still have it. And we still have so, craziness in our government yeah, and so there's still all this still thing here, out there. But I can tell you this, in the last, I would say a couple of weeks, um, my body and my spirit are in unity and I'm more in one. I'm more in sync and I can rest in the sovereignty of the Lord and anchor myself there and I can feel my body at rest and getting what it needs. And so next week we'll explore more what this may look like when we look at that verse, seek first um, his kingdom and righteousness. And all these things will be given to you because God knows that we need all these yes. things, these basic needs. But we sometimes just lose sight of him as a loving father mm -hmm. that knows what we need yeah. and we don't trust. Yeah. And that only increases the anxiety and the worry and the fear. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully the gospel is enough for us this morning to know that God loves us. He's for us. And if Amen. he is for us, then who or what or what circumstance can be against us? And so um, let that be the benediction that you carry with you this morning. If God is for us, uh, then hmm. who? can be yeah. against us. COVID-19, yeah. distance learning, Government. death, <laughs> cancer. Yeah. There's so much in this sin-stained world. But if God is for us, right. then who can be, who or what can be against us? So take that truth with you throughout the rest of this week and let's make Jesus irresistible in our everyday life as we look to our Heavenly Father and trust Him in all things. Yep. Have a great rest of your week. We will see you next Sunday. Go Tom Brady. Go <laughs> <laughs> Bye.